Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the privilege and the blessing of being gathered here this afternoon to open the Word and to read it together and to come before you in prayer and we give thanks for the wonderful privilege that is that we can come here without anyone making us afraid, undisturbed, without any fear of interruption. And we think of many of our brethren who are not in that situation. Every day we hear stories about them and we pray for them, our God and Father, in these circumstances. So we pray your blessing on our being together. We think of some who have not been able to be here and we pray for them. We pray you'll bless them wherever they are, particularly in circumstances of frailty and weakness, our God and our Father. So we just wait before you and seek your blessing on our time together. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Well, we're going to look at chapter 15. Romans, Roman, the epistle to Romans, chapter 15, and we'll read the first six verses. Now we who are strong and ought to know, sorry, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbour for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself. But, as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I trust that God will give us a blessing through these verses of Scripture. When I was <laughs> doing <laughs> a little bit of study for this, these verses, I came across, I, came, I don't know who, who wrote it, it's anonymous, a little verse to dwell up to dwell above with saints we love I that will indeed be glory to dwell below with saints we know I that's another story <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's the sort of situation that the uh, the Apostle Paul is addressing uh, here and he's speaking to these Roman Christians and I, I think the, 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 the governing purpose of this little portion that we've read is summed up really in verse 6 so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what the Apostle Paul is urging them to be uh, united, one accord and one voice. Um, and the whole purpose is to bring in, in their activity and in their walk together is to bring glory, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was writing this letter to a company of Christians that he didn't know personally. So he had no, he had no um, 
ulterior motives in what he was writing. But he was writing to a, a, a company of Christians who were from very different backgrounds. It, it, they weren't like, it wasn't as though he would be addressing a congregation or a company of Christians that were all converted Jews. And in many of the early churches, some of the early churches, they'd be predominantly Jewish. But here he would have quite a diverse uh, a company that he was addressing. Um, and he must have reflected on how he was he was um, brought into the the Christian fellowship. He must have often reflected, I think, on the conversation, the first conversation he ever had with a, a Christian, without being an enmity against him. He would have had spoken to Christians before and been completely unimpressed by his conduct because he was persecuting them. But when he, after he had come to know the, know the Lord on the road to Damascus, this man Ananias was sent to him. And Ananias addressed him as Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Quite a remarkable thing. Ananias came to see this man Saul, who was very well known, a young man who was a, a, a Jewish zealot and who was adamant that there was no other faith or religion that was of any value at all. And he, he um, addressed Paul as brother Saul. And the warmth and friendliness of that greeting, I think, must have made a very deep impression on Saul immediately. And when he joined the Christian fellowship um, in Damascus, he was warmly, if you read what it says, it's clear that he was given an immediate and warm uh, welcome into the Christian fellowship. And his initial impression of these Christians with whom he had been at such enmity before must have really, really opened his eyes and been a tremendous lesson to him. You see, if you go back to the roots of Paul's upbringing in, in Judaism, um, if, you, if you go through the, the, the book of the early, the Mosaic books, and then Joshua, um, there was to be absolutely no accommodation given to anything at all that deviated from the law of Moses and from the teaching of of, Mo of these early, of these, of the Pentateuch, and very, very dire consequences were to be visited on the people of Israel if they departed from that. And Paul's whole manner of life and belief structure would be so absolutely based on that. And suddenly he was confronted with something completely different. And here he has this man coming to him in his blindness, Brother Saul. And then he was introduced into the, 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 the fellowship of Christians in Damascus and he, he experienced the same thing. When he got to Ju Jerusalem, it was a bit different <coughs> because the people there, they would, they would be really all Jewish and they, they, um, they were very, very wary and very suspicious of him. But that was very quickly put aside. And in that, he would experience the, the, uh, the inter, intermediary 
a service of Barnabas. So, at, uh, at uh, Damascus, uh, at, uh, yes, at Damascus, he experienced this warmness from Ananias, and at Jerusalem, he experienced the the, 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 the way that, that Barnabas uh, spoke up on his behalf. And so, Paul would have that, would, would carry with him a lasting impression of that. And so, Paul's first real part experience of participation in a local church was at Antioch. <coughs> and there we see a, quite a diverse uh, company because in, in Acts 13, it tells us about the, the, the church in Antioch. And by that time, Paul himself had become one of the leaders in the church. And, but there was quite a difference in the leadership of the church in uh, Antioch. And we're told that the, the leaders are, are mentioned, Barnabas, he was a man from Cyprus, a Jew, but came from Cyprus. Then we have Simeon, probably could easily have been a black man. He came from uh, Cyrene, which is in Libya, present-day Libya. So there's every chance he might have been a black man. And then Lucius, a Roman. And then you have another man called Manian. Um, and that the, the Hebrew, the Hebrew version of that was would be Menahem. Now, if you if you go back a few years, you'll remember there was a one of the, the prime minister of of Israel was called called Menahem Begin. Um, but this Men, Menahem or Menachem was a foster brother of Herod, Herod Antipas. And then there was Saul. So you had these five men working together. And Paul would have learned in, in that experience the importance of working with other people who might not have seen things just the same way as he saw them. And so that was where he was introduced to active church membership, you might say. So what he he um, uh, what we have here is we ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbour for his good to his edification. I think that this weakness might refer to those who in that uh, fellowship of believers in Rome might not have been in full possession of Christian liberty. You had there a, a company of people, many of whom had been converted by its thought, it might have been the preaching of Peter, but nobody's very sure about that, but that's that's what uh, Bible scholars seem to think, that Peter had been there and had preached. And there would be Gentile, many Gentiles had been converted. But there were Jews. The, the, the original Christians in Rome would have been Jews who had come after the disper dispersion of Christians, after the, the martyrdom of Stephen. And so there was this mixture there and the, the Jewish believers might have still been tied up and bound up in the, the Jewish traditions. And so I think that might have been what Paul was addressing here. Might be bear the weaknesses of those without strength, without strength. And people who might have been quite legal and tried to carry forward the legality of the Jewish traditions into Christianity. 
And Paul says, we've got, he, 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 he's, he's suggesting and he's urging them to forbear with one another. It says, we're to please each of us to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. In other words, Paul wanted them to be taught, but in a, certain, in, a, in a kindly way, in a gentle way, and not in a harsh way. And so he say, in verse 3, he says, even Christ did not please himself. <coughs> and the, this reference to the Lord Jesus Christ really was to appeal to these believers. If he could use Christ as an example and a reference to what's seen in the Lord Jesus Christ should always be appealing to Christians. If we say certain, certain uh, behaviour or a certain manner of life or a certain way of teaching or preaching is the way Jesus would have done it. That makes it attractive. And that's what Paul's putting, saying here. Even Christ did not please himself. Jesus had the absolute authority to please himself. Because if he had pleased himself, what he would have done and what he would have said would have been absolutely right. right because he was perfect. And he would... He would but he didn't live his life on that principle. At the age of 12, the Lord Jesus spoke about being about his father's business. And that characterised his whole life, particularly his public ministry. In John chapter 4, verse 38, he says, I am come down from heaven, not that I should do my will, but the will of him that sent me. Not that I should do my will, and the will of him that sent me. And of course it comes into tremendous relief um, in, the, in Gethsemane. Not my will, but thine be done. So <laughs> that is to test us in all our dealings with one another. Do I try to would, would my would, would I be guilty of trying to impose my will on my brethren or would I um, follow the pattern that we see in Jesus for even Christ did not please himself and so in everything down to seemingly insignificant little details in life we are tested by the perfect pattern that we see in Jesus, and that should be translated into our own behaviour. So he says here, um, each of us is to please his neighbour for his good to his edification. And that is a wonderful way. And so, so many, my observation in, I was going to say in my short life, but uh, <laughs> in my life, um, that many, many of disputes arise in churches and in Christian fellowship. At the root of them, you find what's personal. And that's what Paul is saying here. That that should not, what's personal, should not come in in a way that would cause division or uh, upset or discord among brethren. And that, that was why I suggest, thought that hymn was very good. It was just sang at the beginning, you know. Um, the words of it really appealed to me in that regard. So he says here, whatever is written in the earlier times was written for our instruction. Now that's very interesting. You see, the only scriptures that these 
Christians had. The only scripture, we, we, we've got the Bible here and we've got the Old Testament and we've got the New Testament. And we can have the wonderful privilege of being able to read the Old Testament in the light of the new and the new in the light of the old. And we see, we have the privilege of, uh, under good teaching, of understanding the Old Testament and see how it speaks of what was to come. And I mean, when we have somebody like our brother Eric Scott across, the way he can open up these Old Testament scriptures, absolutely wonderful and been an absolute eye-opener to me in, in many cases. And uh, something like that. But what Paul says here is, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now, we, we, um, we had the privilege had the privilege of going over to uh, on Sunday evening we went over to Bones to the Baptist church here where Alan McBride was preaching and he referred to that scripture about the Hebrew bondman in the in, in the Old Testament and the law that Moses laid down for the Hebrew bondman and it's, we've referred to it here in the past, and how that really is a type of Christ um, being prepared to surrender his will and be brought to the doorpost and have his ear bored through with an awe. And it speaks really of the sufferings of Christ and the fact that he was prepared to go through that suffering to secure his church. I love my master, I love my wife, and I love my children. So that's just a little example of what was written uh, in earlier times, written for our instruction. You see, at the time that was um, put into practice, and it would be put into practice, you would have had, you would have had uh, slaves, bond servants who had uh, come under the ownership of someone and their time to be released had come and they were given a choice they could go out free but they go out alone and that was the choice faced the choice that really we, we see with the lord jesus christ he came in alone he could have gone out alone but these, these Old Testament uh, Christians, no, they're not Christians, these Old Testament saints would put these things into practice and they wouldn't have the foggiest idea of what the real meaning, what the application, what the prophetic meaning was going to refer to. But we see it now. And that's, we have our eyes open to see that. It's a wonderful thing in all these little things that we see that what God had in mind from the very beginning was Christ in the church. Christ in the church. And, and of course, the Apostle Paul brings that out in Ephesians. And he refers to the, 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 that wonderful scripture. On this account, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So, that should be our, our desire to understand the scripture, the Old Testament scriptures, and see how they're, they're being played out in the New, in the New Testament scriptures, and how they apply to us today. And so it says here, they're written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So where do we get this perseverance? Where do we get this encouragement? Well, he says in verse 5, the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. 
And Paul's bringing out here the, the, the vital importance of Christians in a fellowship or a local church being united in thought and mind and the desire for Christ and their desire to uh, understand and be taught by the scriptures in a united way. The unity that should mark um, people walking together in Christian fellowship. I think that's the, what we're, 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 we're encouraged to apply ourselves to here. So that with one accord, in verse 6, you may with one voice, one accord, one voice, in other words, our um, inward desire, uh, one accord refers to what, what, we, what we desire, what, what our thoughts are about it, and with one voice, so that we're inwardly and outwardly, we're united, and what's the purpose? To glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we, we think, uh, looking back, I've seen people who thought they were standing up for principles. But the test in all that is whether these principles we can demonstrate the Spirit of Christ. And finally, in verse, um, in, if we look at the, the, very briefly to the epistle to the Hebrews, the writer there in chapter 12 says this. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That word consider uh, is quite an interesting word in the original Greek. It means to ponder, to ponder, to examine closely, to consider him. And so once again, our thoughts are directed back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider him. Ponder over. Ponder over the way that the Lord Jesus lived. Ponder over the way that he taught. Ponder over the way that he served the Father. Ponder over the way that he obeyed the Father. Ponder over the, the fact that he set his own will aside to be absolutely subject to the Father's will. Consider him. And that's what... The Apostle Paul, you could see that this little, uh, this little passage of scripture um, would be summed up in these two words, consider him, consider Jesus. And that's really our, our little message for today. Alan McBride said to be Ted send his love to the fellowship here and he's looking forward to coming back to see us again in due course. Could we remember to pray for the Israeli Defence Force as a fellowship, airmen, seamen and landmen and Israel, we need to pray for them mm -hmm. every day as we gather together. Mm. We do need to do that, that's right.